Valley, limestone has been quarried since Roman times. And here in Clitheroe, cement has been produced at the Ribblesdale site since 1936. things a little differently now. Here, the drill rig bores a 127mm hole into the rock to a depth of 10 meters. Seen here is a booster which will fire the explosive. Two detonators are fitted into the booster which is then lowered into the shot hole. The liquid explosive, or emulsion, arrives and is pumped into the hole. He then checks that there is a 4.5 metre space above the level of the explosive into which chippings will be placed. This operation is called stemming. The chippings cover the emulsion, effectively capping the hole, which contains 100 kilos of explosive. On this occasion, 25 holes were charged. The shot tubes are connected and the quarry face is now ready for the blast. Before each firing, ground vibration monitors are placed, both here at Rydal Place Clitheroe and at a house in Worston, both about one kilometre away from the quarry base. takes cover in a steel shelter. registered one millimetre per second at Rydal Place and was undetectable at Worston, both readings being well below the legal limit. The blast resulted in a pile of loose rock that can easily be loaded into dump trucks for transportation to the works. Here in Belmont Quarry, 20 tonnes of stone are loaded into each truck to be taken to the crushing plant.
washer reduces the stone to pieces no bigger than 75 millimeters. Conveyor belts then transport the material to the circular stone store. The stacker, seen here, evenly distributes the stone to ensure consistent quality. The controller oversees the process through the crushing plant and alerts the truck driver when to tip the stone. The harrow frame is raking the crushed stone onto the reclaimer chain, collecting the uniform quality of stone. The stone is then fed at a controlled rate onto the belt conveyors where other materials are added to achieve the perfect mix ready for the kiln. Once in the roller mill, the stone is ground to a fine powder by three 45-ton rollers, seen here during repairs. The finely ground raw material is sucked out of the top of the mill and blown into the top of the 10,000-ton constant flow silo from where it is extracted from various points and blown into the kiln. But not this kiln. The old process used a lot of water which had to be evaporated and was very inefficient, using twice as much fuel per tonne of product as is used today. The modern process is in two stages. The kiln feed enters the top of the preheater tower and the final heating at 1400 degrees Celsius takes place in this rotating tube called the kiln. The fuel is fed both to the kiln and the preheater tower. The flame in the kiln burns about four tons an hour of powdered coal. coal is delivered by truck and stored ready for grinding. The crane seen here is unmanned and operates automatically from this computer in the control room. The coal is now ground to a fine powder in the mill containing 18 and a half tons of steel balls. Other fuels include waste tires that have been chipped into small pieces, making them suitable for burning in the preheater. Using alternative fuels means burning less coal, therefore reducing the emission of carbon dioxide emitted to the atmosphere.
Today, only 10% of the fuel used is coal, and the rest are alternative recycled fuels. As recently as 20 years ago, the kiln burned only coal. is known as meat and bone meal. And is the waste from meat processing plants, ground and dried into this coarse meal. Also used to heat the kiln is this solid recovered fuel or SRM. It's extracted from domestic refuse and is made up of paper, plastic and other materials that cannot be recycled. Also used is SEM fuel, which is recycled solvents and has the appearance of dirty engine oil. It's a blend of waste solvent from paint manufacture, printing, chemical and car industries. The safe delivery of sand fuel is taken very seriously and here you can see that the tanker must be electrically earthed preventing any sparking before offloading can commence. A sample of each load is taken and tested to ensure it complies with the specification agreed with the Environment Agency. 55% of all fuels are directed to the preheater tower and heat the kiln feed to a temperature of 880 degrees. The whole process is managed from a centralised control room. But not this one, of course. The current control room has many computer screens which monitor 600 separate drives and there are up to 5,000 alarms and signals that are dealt with daily. These are just two of the items operated from here which alone will consume in one year enough electricity to power an average home for 6,000 years. The kiln controller is in radio contact with his line operators out on the plant who may be called upon to resolve problems such as this. Come in Alan. Hello Alan, do you think you could, uh, can you go to the tyre uh, bell please? There's, I think we've got something blocking it. Okay, okay, I'll check that out. Before the operator can carry out his task, the equipment must be isolated and locked off. An exhaust fan gas scrubber was fitted in the late 1990s at a cost of £5 million to reduce emissions of gases that contribute to acid rain. A mixture of kiln feed and water is sprayed at high pressure across the gases so that the discharge from the chimney is mostly water vapour. The 
fuel controller also oversees the discharge from the chimney and ensures that the emissions fall within the limits set by the Environment Agency. The kiln feed has now been turned into small black balls or clinker. About 100 tonnes an hour leave the kiln and is cooled by several fans before being transported either to the clinker store, affectionately known as the wigwam, or to the cement mill areas for grinding. Cement is made up of clinker and 5% gypsum, seen here being transported by the overhead crane. Gypsum is used to aid the setting process. The clinker and gypsum are ground together in a ball mill, which is a rotating steel tube containing 42 tons of steel balls measuring 90 mm in diameter in the first chamber and 116 tons of smaller 20 mm balls in the second chamber, producing the fine powder we all know as cement. laboratory is equipped with the latest devices, including X-ray analytical apparatus and a robot to speed up the testing of cement samples. The operator of the cement mills, also based in the control room, ensures that the right grade and quantities of cement go to the correct silos for bulk loading or packing into bags. But not by this machine anymore, where the bags were placed by hand onto continually rotating spouts. Today's packing machines are automatic and require very little input from the operator. Here rolls of plastic bags are fed into the packer and filled with 25 kilograms of cement. Plastic bags are a recent innovation, enabling cement to be stored outside without getting wet or setting in the bag. Today, about 20% of the bagged output is in plastic bags. The bags travel along belt conveyors. and are then automatically placed onto pallets. A small amount of glue is sprayed between each layer to stop the bags from sliding around. Each pallet of bags is stretch wrapped for further stability and weatherproofing.
helmets are loaded onto trucks. But I'm sure you'll realize not this one from the 1930s. These curtain-sided wagons take pallets, two at a time, so that loading is required from one side only. Each pallet weighs 1.4 tons, 20 pallets per truck, making 28 tons in total. Cement is also delivered in bulk tankers, much bigger than the one seen here from the 1930s. Today's trucks hold 30 tons, and deliver cement to the bigger companies, including bricks and tiles manufacturers. Every vehicle has to be precisely weighed before it leaves the works, to record the tonnage and to meet the road traffic regulation. Approximately 200,000 tonnes of cement per year are dispatched by rail to Glasgow and Avonmouth. Where they are unloaded into silos and then into trucks for local delivery. Again, each truck is weighed to meet the requirements of the railway. This particular train transported 1,064 tonnes of cement to Avonmouth. Five trains of cement a week leave the Ribblesdale works, reducing the truck congestion on the roads. These trains must leave the works at designated times, specified by network rail, and will leave even if not fully loaded. The film you have seen shows a condensed picture of cement manufacture here at the Ribblesdale site. Cement is an essential part of our modern life, whether it is used in the building of our homes or the grander projects seen here. And the cement works at Clitheroe has played a vital role not only in the local area but in the whole of the Northwest since 1936.